Um, there are days where I do feel like I'm living out my why, and then there are days where I I have to unlearn cosplaying enlightenment and like, and that's a tough process. You know, I have to like contend with my imposter syndrome mm -hmm. because sometimes like. Either you or other people can put you on a pedestal because you know how to talk and you know how to deduce situations. And at the end of the day, you're human, eh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, I think in God's love, I am living my purpose. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Introducing the epitome of luxury living. Galu Luxury Villas and Suites, your private sanctuary of opulence and elegance. Nestled amongst the lush, sun-kissed landscapes of Durban, KwaZulu-Natal, this Galu Luxury Villa is a paradise of tranquility, offering breathtaking panoramic views of the neighborhood. Step into a world of refined luxury where every detail has been meticulously crafted to create an atmosphere of sophistication and comfort. This villa is kept within a gated and secure property for your peace of mind. The Kalu Villa is available for both short-term and long-term stays, making it the ideal location for your next vacation or special event. This villa boasts spacious living areas and floor-to-ceiling windows that flood the interior with natural light, making you feel at one with the surrounding beauty paired with multiple terraces, an outdoor lounge and a dining area. Live the dream, make memories and indulge in the life you deserve. Contact us today to book your stay or to learn more about this exquisite property. Your oasis of opulence awaits. Um... Uh, uh, so sometimes I get into trouble mm -hmm. for not introducing my guests, <laughs> which I can feel is redundant sometimes because I mean, if you are logged on to this, it means this is not this is not like programmed television where the next show plays because the the other one has ended. Mm -hmm. It means you have taken a decision to click on a button so that you can consume this content. Yes. Um, which, and your name is there. There's a description box. Yes. There's, there's all of this, yes. right? But for formality's sake, um, you're Nirvana. Am I pronouncing yes. it correctly? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> How do people usually pronounce it? Siavana. <laughs> I don't know if they see the S or hear it. <laughs> Savana Navarra. Yeah, yeah. Why the double barrel surname? Well, that's uh, that's the decision that my mother and father decided, mm -hmm. and yeah, I kind of just grew up with it, and I went with it. Yeah. So the double barrel is from them, and it's not because you married somewhere, no, no. somehow, some. No, it's but it's weird because so like so my second surname is Umselego, mm -hmm. and you know a lot of people like I was stopped by the cops the other day, and they're like, Umselego. actually no, it started with the dentist. So I went to a specific dentist and she's like, Whom You must be rich, hey? Is all and the one that we watched on his table? Is that your father? I'm like, no, that's not my father. Yeah. Um, but the weird thing is about Abu Umselegu, like my dad has like nine children. And like there's a lot of moms. <laughs> so I'm not too far from You're not that. too far from that reality, <laughs> reality. right? Yeah. Um so Norwe is your mom. Yes. And then Mselego is your dad. Yes. Were they together? Is this well when I say were they together, did they ever marry? I mean, why the decision to have this yes. double barrel? Well, they were yes, they married um a customary marriage, okay. which okay. was uh Ilobola. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but it wasn't like to be honest, it wasn't complete um, because there's like multiple stages to umshat. Sure. We're seeing too. Mm -hmm. And that's something that like in general, in the past, I would say five years, I've just kind of been rediscovering what the proper customs are because um, I've had to really invest in umsamoa sekaya and mm -hmm. rectifying the whole surname issue because mm -hmm. one thing I've been constantly taught 
or told growing up is that minangia bangwa. And so, hmm. um, you know, really now, you know, with the resources such as like Umsamo Institute online and also my mentor, my special mentor and big brother, Shaka Sisulu, I've really, really gotten to the science of Isintu. Okay, okay. And so, you know, back then they thought that was enough. Like most black families now who have kind of been like removed from um, their customs and their traditions think Klampe Ilobola is enough or maybe one goat for 10 children is enough for Imbelego when it, you know, there's, it's actually a process. It's not that it's not enough. It's not, it's just incomplete. Yeah. Perhaps let's go there. Um, you speak of Ogbangwa, which loosely translated means um, you are being fought for yes. by the two families that make make up your your identity yeah um how were these families fighting for you what did you identify in your spirituality where you realized that these people bang banga mm. and what have you discovered so far in trying to fix what you believe was the mess shucks i would say that like i guess the symptoms in my life of mm -hmm. bangwa were um i think uh, and i and i want to be very careful when i use these words because i don't think that that depression, the only root cause of depression is umsamonga nungi. Sure. Right? I think there's so many different factors like mshabeni that are contributing to um, like a, I guess, a, a mental dysfunction and a, a kind of like dysmorphia that you have with your environment and yourself. But I, I would say that I just, I never felt, uh, number one, I never felt like I belonged. And two, there was a pattern of... um there was just a pattern of like, number one, being unsettled and also not feeling like the things that are happening in my life are, are cemented and they, and they belong to me. Like, how do I put this? Like I could be going to a specific school mm -hmm. and I would have this anxiety that at any moment this is going to be taken away, Okay, you know, or I could be living in a specific home and have that anxiety of, it, it, I, I never felt grounded in my environment. Um, and I think I would also contribute the lack of groundedness to the fact that as a child, I did travel quite a bit. Um, I traveled so much because of the arts and culture program that my family was running, Guamashu in, in, in KZN, as well as here in Joburg. And they had a branch in India. And it was like essentially like a, a, a program to uplift kids in the township or, you know, whatever displacements that they're in mm -hmm. through the arts and culture and kind of like giving us tools to navigate life. And it was a lot about self-development and helping helping us think outside of the box of the environment that we're in. Sure, sure, sure. So um, as a result, the blessings that came with that was like being able to travel um, and like do cultural exchanges, learn about our indigenous culture and share that with the world and learn about others' indigenous cultures and, and you know, expand our minds. So maybe it's that and a combination of just, yo, like nothing is mine. Like not even my father mm -hmm. was, was mine. You know, I didn't have a, um, a very grounded, secure relationship with a lot of things growing up. And so I think that was a symptom what do you do in attempting to fix? You did mention that you have a mentor by Ushaga Sisulu and yeah. the likes. Um, what are you discovering as you're fixing? Like what what, what steps do you take? Um, I, I'm deliberately going deep into this because you're a young person. We're probably similar ages. And so many young people have neglected their spirituality, mm -hmm. um, chasing materialism, mm -hmm. chasing fame, mm -hmm. because you also have fame. So I... I the, from the perspective of a person who has fame, mm -hmm. there's also groundedness that is important. Mm -hmm. um, how are you finding yourself again after feeling like parts of you have been lost? Shucks. Um, it's been such a long journey and um, it's still like the more I heal, the more I'm like, wow, yes, I indeed. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm okay with like, I'm finally at a place where I'm like, okay, I'm okay with the journey being long. I, I feel like I have the formula to to discover things and heal things. Okay, okay, right? okay. I feel empowered with the toolkit and the community and the harmony in my family and in Umsamo to be able to fix things that need to be fixed. Mm -hmm. So with me, it, so maybe people might say, because I have a double barrel surname, that between 
Nokwe, which is my mother's surname, and Msenegu, yeah. which is my father's surname. Sure. When not even. Okay. Ubangwa, wa wa mi and umsamo wa mi started with um uh an incomplete marriage. It was definitely a marriage. Okay. Um, but that tau koko nomkulu, but there was something that hadn't been. You know, I'm trying to be very careful because I, I don't want to be disrespecting my elders <laughs> like this, but like something had not been done in the correct timeline sure. with regards to their marriage. Okay. So their children were born out of traditional wedlock. Mm -hmm. um, and so they actually belong to my grandmother's surname. So I actually, like when I did in Belegoyam, I think it was about two, three years ago, I had to do it because we did my soul. Okay. Yes, so Ukbang Wawa Kona was not even here. Okay, it goes it way was, back. It, it was way back. Yeah, yeah. And so, and it's funny because, like, when I hear the stories about, like, Ukoko Mkulu, Ukoko Wami, Mampongela, like, I'll hear that because um, my great grandfather on my, you know, my, my, my grandmother's side, um, the father of my grandmother, he was a pastor and he, he said, oh, what's he? he's stopping in Belero. And okay. it stopped with my grandmother. Like, she was the last person to have in Belero done in that lineage. So there was a gap between practicing tradition um, because there is a person who came in with born-again Christian values. And in those years of the gap, it's where you believe a lot of the cultural practices that carve who you are were lost. Yeah, I think it's a combination of things and I wouldn't I wouldn't only, you know, blame it on the born again Christian thing. He cuz he was a pastor of the Ethiopian church and he he very much utilized his spiritual gifts that he attained from sure, sure. you know, his traditionalism or his Ubuntu ba okay. Um but he he stopped it because he was like like okay. it's, it's too much. Like I have so cuz he had a lot of children. I have so many children. How many goats am I going <laughs> to? Yeah, yeah. And how many times does a child have to suffer because a goat wasn't slaughtered at a specific time? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, a, mm -hmm. um, so I can empathize with him and I can understand where he was coming from. Um, but for me as a person of like many generations after having gone through the things I've gone through and having seen what my family's gone through, um, also there was a part of me that was angry. Um, because I'm like, hey, oh, see, I'm like, we wouldn't be going through this and da 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 da. Um, but then Christianity comes in. Mm -hmm. uh, um, Christianity comes in in the sense that, like, uh, there are verses in the Bible that speak about rejoicing because of the suffering that you're going through because mm -hmm. it's building your character. Mm -hmm. So um, it's not lost on me the gift of the confusion and the mm -hmm. turmoil and the suffering because hmm. you can't. I can't buy that. Mm -hmm. That's the that's the one the experiences that I've gone through in life and the wisdom that I've been able to accumulate and retain are some things that money can't buy. And I think at the heart of a lot of young people deviating from African spiritualities because there is a confusion with regards to what matters and what doesn't mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and what formulas you know, like what is the foundation? What is one plus one equals two? Because there's a lot of people who are taking advantage, who are, you know, spiritual leaders who are taking advantage sure. of people and not educating them. Yeah, yeah. And then they end up in like very weird situations where they're spiritually being manipulated. And when I study like, like our cultures and our customs, I'm like, this is a lot about spiritual autonomy. Mm -hmm. And the reason we perform these customs, you know, the reason we do in Belego is because we're introducing this child to the ancestors and we're giving them like a spiritual ID card. Okay. And then when we do Msanya it's like Siakulis Walingana but Dala needs to know what's Lingana I sang Lebele. Like give them the set of spiritual wisdom and, and tools to navigate adulthood. Sure. And then umemolo again ni ski was I or Pumayo Pilela manja as a Kelly Kai. Make their own decisions. Yes, yes. And maybe it's not even Uza Kelly Kai wa kela umkulwako because that's how it how it works, you yeah. know. So um yeah, it's like I get it, but there's a lot of people who don't get it and there's a lot of people who cosplay getting it. Oof. 
And that's why so many people are like, I'd rather not because at least with Christianity, I can reference this book. Sure, 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 sure. But even within Christianity, the, the same reason people are deviating from African spir spirituality and, and is the same reason people are deviating from Christianity mm -hmm. because there's a lot of us who are biblically Ill illiterate. Sure. You know, a lot of people don't understand the book of Galatians and what that means in its entirety. A lot of us don't understand that like, you, as much as we read the Bible in a specific order, it's not really, I don't want to say it's not really chronological, but what I'm saying is it's the whole, everything that's happening in the Bible, right, is one story, one unifying story leading to Christ mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and Christ's love. Yeah, yeah. And so um, the issue becomes when somebody's like, hey, but you, this is in the Bible, so I can do this. No, that's not how you read the Bible. You know, you read it in context. And that context is informing so many other things that's leading to Christ. And what, you know, Christ symbolizes is that if you, of course, in the book of Galatians, if I remember correctly, you know, if you have faith in me, then you don't have to go through the curse of not, you know, being able to fulfill all of Moses' 10, ten commandments. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. And so in the same way, I can see, like, but we're seeing to how ingana yenzangi belegusia isi ashupe, yabo. We have a, but, but like, I don't think that we should separate these two. I think there is a, a balance where you, you can acknowledge what your genetics and your DNA and your lineage have agreed to do and have been in contract in like, I'll make an silly example. Like by the age of one, you need to have like cut the tip of your, your, your finger, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, that's a contract. You know, how do we then acknowledge the contract, understand what the function was and heal the necessity of that contract and resolve that contract? Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. And I feel like that can be done through God's love. But even then, it's not just picking up a Bible because you can read the Bible without the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's all interwoven. And I think for me and my healing, I'm realizing, Wuti, um, I, I just have to be respectful and not just respectful, I have to, like, because I came across something called theta healing, and that's another conversation, that another rabbit hole. But it's teaching me how to be able to hold these two truths that are actually not separate from each other, you know, Christianity and African spirituality. It's teaching me how to use God's unconditional love to heal certain contracts, because... Hmm. I didn't do A, B, and C. And then also, if I make a mistake doing A, B, and C, yeah. then the world ends. No, it doesn't have to be that way. And that's, I think, what in the book of Galatians, God, like Christ is trying to tell us, like, if you believe in my love, you know, if you really believe in my love, you enter the kingdom of heaven. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And in Theta Healing, you heal in God's unconditional love. And that requires you to believe in the higher power. And that requires you to invest yourself and bear everything that you have, all of the genetic contracts, curses that you have to that love and allow it to be healed. And that's a process. It doesn't just happen because now I identify as a Christian or now. Because you, you, you part it like covenants require, like it's a, I look at it as a handshake, mm -hmm. right? And God extends their hand or his hand to you and you and you shake hands and this is the covenant this is the promise i'm making to you and and maybe it's going to come in like 14 generations from now but i made a promise to you but you have to participate in that promise okay so in the same way just labeling myself as a christian is not enough I have to participate in his love would you say with this enlightenment that you have and this self-discovery that you have would you say right now you are living out your purpose like you're living your why um there are days where i do feel like i'm living out my why and then there are days where i i have to unlearn cosplaying enlightenment and like and that's a tough process you know i have to like contend with my imposter syndrome mm -hmm. because sometimes like Either you or other people can put you on a pedestal because you know how to talk and you know how to deduce situations. And at the end of the day, you're human, eh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, 
I think in God's love, I am living my purpose. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What's been what's been something um, obviously that you're willing to share with us? What remember it's for the purposes of using your journey to 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 ignite power and grow the person who's consuming this. What has been your biggest failure to date? Oh, <laughs> oh wow, um, that's a big question. Uh, failure and like personal development or career wise failure in your life and the the, the uh, i know you you you're asking me so that you you take more time to think about something else other than what you're thinking about because <laughs> you, you know there is, is. <laughs> because there is something <laughs> that because all of us have that thing in our lives or those few things not even that thing those few things that immediately come to us and trigger us and you know them I know exactly what right <laughs> <laughs> okay fine fine okay, okay. Oh, geez. I would say that, like, I think my biggest failure is, um, yeah, how do, how do I even describe this? I think because I have, like, deep wounding with regards to abandonment. Okay. I think once I find the kind of security and love that I've been yearning for, the kind of, like, passion and reciprocation, I think, my biggest failure is in giving myself up for that. Hmm. Um, and that's something that just this morning I had to contend with and be like, okay, this is something I need to sit down with in God's unconditional love and like accept about myself that, you know, I, I do feel transactional about my being and, hmm. and not in a materialistic way, but in a very emotional way. You know, in a in a in a once I find that community or once I find that person that gives me that sense of security that I did not have, as toxic as it may be, I I give myself up and it's it's not even a question. I do it. I do it. Do you ignore red flags? No, because you you it. W- because what I'm trying to understand is, do you believe that you quickly give yourself up or you believe that you give yourself up too much to other people? I, I believe I, I give myself up too much even when I, I recognize red flags. I'm very, I'm very vocal about when I see a red flag. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think for my community and my environment, it's unnerving because I don't think people are used to maybe a young black girl being able to articulate the kind of like, you know, for example, I'll just make an example of like ostr- like very sublime misogynistic ostracization that you experience at a table because nobody's listening to you just mm-hmm. because you're a woman, you know? Mm-hmm. Like, I don't think a lot of people are able to just say that out loud or like call it out and like have people understand. They're like, oh my gosh, I didn't realize I was being this way. Yeah. Um, but in the same way, like, as much as I can identify red flags and call them out, I still have a weakness of believing that like I'm not gonna get the love that I want in the way I want it if I don't give myself up. Who comes from a place? Um, I'm not a psychologist. I'm, a, I'm an engineer by profession, um, so I'm a science guy. But what I'm sensing is. Um, would it, does it not come of, from a place of how you're saying you traveled and you, your parents were there, but they were not there? Yeah, absolutely. They were oh, like, yeah. they were there, but they were not there. Absolutely. Because they were so concerned with community upliftment absolutely. to the extent that they could have abandoned the, the nuclear family because they cared at the charity work. Absolutely. You're 100% right. And I think... I think both my parents experienced that to some degree, um, maybe to degrees that they, they're they maybe desensitized to. Um, but yeah, absolutely, you're spot on. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I think was my dad, um, like my dad was in my life for, I think, was it four, five, six years? And then he disappeared for five years, you know? So there's a portion where my dad was in my life and my dad was able to give me, I don't know how to describe this. Like somebody can be toxic, but they can still get you. Mm-hmm. And like, they don't like judge your, how do I put this? Like my dad and I were like on the same emotional frequency. I hear you. Yeah. 
And so I really felt seen by my dad. And my mom was like far more grounded mm-hmm. in like in everything. Like my, my mom had strong will. My mom was, I wouldn't say less emotional, but she she was like a tree. Okay. She's an earth sign. Yeah. You know, yeah. earth signs I would like to attribute to like being very sober minded and grounded. Whereas my dad and I was like a Pisces and a Cancer with swimming in the sea, you know, like all emotions and mm-hmm. ways and intuition mm-hmm. and things like that. And so I felt really seen by that. And I felt like not judged by that. And and he was so volatile and it was very confusing to process because he was like a, he was a violent man, but at the same time, he was such a loving man, mm. you know? And I witnessed, so I was with him for, I don't, I think it was four or five years. And then he disappeared like he he went to the UK. We know we know where he went to. He went to the UK because he had bipolar stage two, and mental health care in the UK was free. Okay, so it was easier to navigate in South Africa. We didn't have it was very much an inaccessible thing, and people in general still like, is. Yes, still is. Yeah, and people in general didn't understand um, what he was going through. What he was going through. Yeah. We didn't have the conversations that we're having now. So he went to the UK. Some of his kids were in the UK. And um, one of his, uh, the mother of his children was also there. So he had a family. A family, base. yeah. And he was gone for five years. So it, 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 it almost felt like he disconnected from this family to go live with his other family and life went on. Yeah, life life went life went on and, and it was painful. Yeah, yeah. I don't even remember when he left. I, I just remember the moments where I last saw him and he was like, he looked like a, he looked like a, you know, those dogs that like are barking like mm, mm, in mm. like Mendoza's music video. Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. Like he looked like that. That was the last time I saw him before the five year sabbatical. And then cried to my mom. I was like, I can't do this anymore. I need to see my dad. So she booked flights to the UK and I sacrificed my, I think it was sixth grade camp to go see him which is something that I, for years, had been looking forward to. Sure. We go to the UK, we see him. It's awkward as yeah. an MF, you know? And yeah, then I the last two, three, four days, I was just crying nonstop because we're going back home. And we literally sit on the couch and I would like lean on his shoulder, start crying, take a nap, wake up, cry. Take, that would be us the whole day. Then you'd go home, come back. And that year, he said he was coming back home, and he passed away. Hmm. And I think I felt that because of the connection I had with him. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. both on emotion, the same emotional frequency. So yeah, it's just like you're, you you hit it on the nail. Um, I never felt grounded. I felt. I, I think that's why I give myself up so easily because that was the pattern in my childhood. Okay, let me give up this grade six experience. You know, it's camp. It may not seem important to other people, but it was important to me. But my dad is more important to me. So yeah. automatically love and people are more important to me than like what I actually need to do for myself. When was that? When, which year did dad pass? 2008 2008 so so it's been a while but do you think grief also was contributed to how your character formed in the long run yeah yeah absolutely um absolutely i think uh i think the reason i fixate and i'm so obsessive about so many different things like african spirituality astrology christianity like i fixate to like try and figure out like what the thing is because um i you know, I feel like I could have saved my dad. Mm. And like, yeah, it's it's crazy. And and, and it's, you know, but I rejoice because I, I see things that people don't see. You know, I see dynamics and patterns way before something happens. And I'm like, this is going to happen. And if you don't take care of it now, you're not going to like it. And then it happens. And then people are like, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. or I'll come with like the vigor and the passion of something is already happening because I'm seeing a glimpse of it. And it's like, Navani, you're being so unreasonable. And then I leave the situation and it's like, shucks, you were right. Yeah. 
And I, I don't know what God is trying to teach me. I think a portion of it is surrender. But um, yeah, it, it created a, a beast of an investigator. <laughs> and somebody who's hungry to understand people in such a like a deep, deep, deep way and understand what's going on in the world, understand what's going on in the stars, like to the point where I'd like check what was going on in my dad's astrology when he passed away. And I was like, shucks, if I'd known this yeah. when I was 12 years old, I could have said. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Scary. And I think also the reason I sacrificed myself is because somewhere deep down, I believe that not everybody is competent enough to save themselves in the way I feel like I could have saved my dad. So I needed to be with him for him to be alive. Hmm. Yo, what is this turning into? <laughs> <laughs> okay, let me go lighter. Let, 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 let's go lighter. <laughs> you welcome. It was a bit of a relief. Damn. To, to, to speak welcome? it out. I, I'm very fine. As I said, I've done this 107 times. <laughs> um, on a lighter note, uh, it, it seems like your parents being in in, 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 in in the creative space, it was only inevitable uh, that you're going to be a creative as well. Mm-hmm. How did Outlaws find you? And you may correct me because I believe Outlaws is your biggest breakthrough in yes, the industry. Absolutely. How did it find you? And when it did find you, what happened in your brain when you realized, oh my gosh, this is happening? Wow. Um, <clears throat> well, how did Outlaws find me? So... Um, I was in, I was at the Durban Film Festival because okay. I studied screen arts and television. So I'm trained to be behind the camera. Um, and we were there with my school and I was interacting with a bunch of people and I just knew because of the training I'd got, gotten as a child, how to navigate certain spaces in ways that perhaps my peers, you know, were anxious to because they, how do I put this? Like. They didn't have the experience I had traveling and like interacting with these senior people. So I knew how to just slip into an environment. And I met a lady named Flavia Mozzizi and she was a co-founder of Swift. And um, she was just like, yeah, come like, come join us. And this was in, I think, 2016, 2017. And um, I think we exchanged numbers and I exchanged numbers with a bunch of people because we had to network. Years passed, maybe she'd like, uh, say, like audition for this, you know, she's a commissioning editor at Trimax. Sure, yeah. sure. So, so she's like, uh, let, let's see what she can do. Mm-hmm. And I'd do it and I wouldn't get it like for years, huh. you know, for years. And then, um, I didn't have an agent, uh, when I got the call to come audition for, uh CKBL on 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 outlaws mm-hmm. um i had just left my agency because i was like i need to find an agent that's more aligned with my spirits and i had specific needs i mean they weren't terrible but like i needed yeah, alignment yeah. you know and so yeah i got i got a text message from our lovely costi- costing director kinelio madize and she was like yo can you send like a self-tape for this and as soon as I read the brief, I was like, this is what I'm hungry for. <laughs> like I was like a child in a in a in a candy shop. Show. Yeah, yeah. You know, I was yeah. like, this is exactly what I've been yearning for. This is the depth, the 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 respect, the culture. This I felt like so many of the the nuances of who I am as a Zulu, like a modern day Zulu woman. Sure. Came together. Exactly. And yeah. it's like I'm so hungry to be you know, this really cool academic in some way, but also being hmm. like how, like where are the roles that show that, you know? Mm, mm. And it just came and I was like, this is my, I was like, I prayed about it. I was like, this, this has to be mine. And I asked my mom to help me with the translations because they're from Bergville. So okay. there's a specific kind Dialect. of yeah. yes, yes. So I was like, we did it. And, and I, and I did the audition and I gave what I could you know, and I'm happy to share that audition with you if you want. Pause. Because we all go through this. When you gave what you could, did it feel enough at the moment when you were giving it? Um, I was in it. Okay. Yeah, I was definitely in it. Um, But I know what you're talking about. Yeah. And sometimes it doesn't feel. Sometimes it doesn't. Yes. Even though it's because of how many times you've been rejected. Mm-mm-mm. It feels like, ah, yeah, I'm, yes. I'm just trying. Yes, but I think. 
I think this is why I'm and you know, we we don't always have the luxury to do this. But I think this is why, like, in general, just a rule of thumb that I've I'm learning to really trust is go with your excitement. Like the things that excite you give you an energy or give you access to parts of yourself that you can afford to the world that are exactly the magic that's needed. Okay. So I submitted the tape and then I got a callback and there were two rounds of the callback. And then the last round, I was the only girl auditioning with like, we're doing a chemistry read with like, um, who the person who was meant to be my husband. Okay. So we did that. And even then I didn't like, that's where that I'm not like that. Mm, um, it's mm, not enough thing mm, came mm, in mm, mm. where it was like, I know I'm the only girl, but I don't think I got it. Like, mm, mm, mm. yo, I was, and people are like, Navani, you definitely, you're the, you're the only person here. How can you feel the amount of doubt mm. that someone who hasn't even made it to this round is feeling? Mm. And, um, yeah, I doubted it. Uh, I didn't think I got it. And then I got it. And then I doubted it some more. <laughs> I imposter syndrome, guys. It's crazy. Yeah, yeah. But I knew there was a level of me that knew. Where do the doubts come from? <sighs> to be honest, they come from when people... Uh, and it's not a bl- it's not a blaming of people. It's 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 a It's an assessment of my character and how much I value people's thoughts about me and how they perceive me. So, for example, growing up, Abantu didn't think huh. you know? And then and when people hear me speak is Zulu, they're like, where are you from KZN? Yeah. You know? Yeah. And so um constantly needing to prove myself in that way that I'm Zulu enough, I'm black enough, mm-hmm. I'm not black too much yeah because yeah. you know you go into like white space or not or non-black space and then you want to assimilate yes yeah. yes yes um or you have to mm-hmm. um so it comes from putting an emphasis on how important other people's perception of mm. me is because when people when i was like my authentic self and i felt relaxed and i and i and i really just sat into like who nirvana is i noticed how much it offended people um but in life, like as a society, and we were talking about this earlier, like how people can hate to an unnatural degree mm, on Twitter mm, for mm. things that have nothing to do with them, mm-hmm. you know, um, things that aren't even like, you know, betraying the the humanity that we're trying to preserve amongst sure, each other. Sure. People shame people for existing in many different ways. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. Ageism sexism, homophobia, uh, misogyny, misandry, so many things. Mm -hmm. And it's all very creative ways of saying, you don't belong on this earth. You know what I mean? And do you also think something as minuscule as, oh, I don't have enough followers for this because now we exist in a world like that. Yeah. My gosh, this is a big role. It's a lead. Do I even have enough followers for this role? Oh my gosh, Showmax is international. They all be like, ah, they need a person with 1 million followers on Instagram. I'm, I'm sure even things like that start rushing in your brain. Yeah, and also it's it's a it's a volatile industry. Yeah. You never know, like there isn't like a set standard. Like metrics of success are hmm. this for everybody. Yeah. You being a good actor... And being perfect for the role could not be enough. Hmm. And that's me- like, it's such a messed up thing to me, yeah, right? Yeah. Because people say art is subjective. And I disagree, you know? It is to a certain degree. But I do think that there are standards of like an artistic pursuit and what a person is able to afford. Sure. Their audiences. And I think everybody intuitively knows what that standard is. And then there are some people who just, I hate to say it, but like they don't belong in certain positions to make certain decisions. I get you. You know, and they end up making, and they end up like valuing things that have have nothing to do with the value of this person in this specific role. Oof. So even that, because I've been doing this for 11 years, right? And even after having done like film and television for 11 years and being being in the entertainment industry since the age of four 
um, I'm still an, an up and coming. Hmm. It's never enough until, I think South Africa is deeply ageist. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. But it's never enough until you look old enough. Like some people think I'm, um, some people thought I was 16 on set. Some people thought I was 21. <laughs> you know, some people, and and sometimes it works to my, because what's this guy's like, I really do, um, uh, what's the word? I think it's omit my power. Okay. Yeah. Like I really know how to make my power sit. Mm-hmm. I know how to sit on top of my power and like not really showcase it to people. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, sometimes, especially when you're dealing with legends and mm-hmm. veterans who hold you and coddle you in it with kitten gloves mm-hmm. and, and, and you want to learn from them. Mm-hmm. So in that regard, it helps. Okay. But in another regard, it's just, it just works against you <laughs> because people think, you don't know how to act. Yeah. You yeah. just care. This is your first. People, some people think Outlaws is my first role. I'm like, no, it's not. My first role was like on a Biatham Goza film in like 2016. Mm, mm, and then mm. it was followed by like a BBC family mm. TV show, which was, you know, like there's just so many things and I'm still up and coming. Yeah. 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 So every, cause the film and television industry and, and, and just like the entertainment industry as a whole is so vast that some things, ma- like some environments don't matter as much to other people. Sure. They'll completely disregard your experience in that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it also like that I'm not good enough comes from that because the metrics of success are constantly changing. Hmm. And I think that breeds such an environment of, you know, being able to manipulate people. Because now if somebody's like, yeah, you know, I, re- you know, we really got to believe, you know, you got to be, ta- you got to have the talent, the swag, the whatever, that, that star quality. And let's say you have all of those things, but this person's like, but yeah, I got to feel motivated by it. What are you going to do to motivate that person? What are your options to motivate that person? And it's so unfortunate that so many artists have to like encounter people like that hmm. and what happens in those instances when they have to motivate someone on a personal level yeah. to get them to believe in them? You've completed Outlaws now. I mean, the, the the show is running on Showmax, obviously on a streaming platform. It lives on and lives on. Um, are you now like, okay, I'm an actress now. Does mm-hmm. it does it affirm you now what I know? Anything that I can I can audition for or I'm called for now, I'm, I, I was Sikhebiela. Um, no. Oh, no. <laughs> it's sad. Ne? Yeah. The industry is structurally a mess then. Yes, yeah. it is. Um, no. Uh, what I will say, though, is one thing that really has affirmed me is like the nomination for Best Actress TV mm-hmm. um, uh, in the Simon Mapunu Sabela Awards. Yeah. As well as Best Newcomer. Mm-hmm. In the same awards. Yeah. That makes me feel like I'm almost an actress. <laughs> <laughs> and like, I'm like, I'm almost an actress. And like, I could, like, if I, it's so, it's, it's not a, I know it's toxic. Mm, mm. If I win, then I'm officially an actress. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? Um, and it's not a productive way to think about one's achievements, you know? And I know that, and it's something that I'm working on. But the system, um, exactly. Nirvana, has has produced that out of people because you, for example, let's say you master the arts of acting, as you were saying, the metrics change so many times that you have mastered acting. Let's say this morning you go to an audition, mm-hmm. you feel like, oh my gosh, I did great. And the sad thing about this industry is that sometimes you don't even get a response. <laughs> And in three months' time, that show airs on TV mm. and it's airing with the person who did okay. not fit the brief you were given. Absolutely. You were like, but this is not the brief we were given when I was auditioning for this role. Mm-hmm. How the hell is that person on it? Yeah. And not in a jealous manner. You're just questioning the system. It would help. Because yeah, the brief said uh, a Zulu girl with this body type, age, who speaks this dialect of Zulu. Yeah. And then the role goes to a vendor woman who's a bit f- bigger than this, uh, like different age. Can't be back for this role. Absolutely. Yeah. It's confusing. Yeah. You don't know what makes you valuable. You know, what is what is gonna make me worth getting this role? You know, um, and it's 
yeah, then you just have to be resolute and like therapy is important in these instances. Yeah. Like you had like I don't think you in general, I don't think you should just go to therapy when something terribly traumatic's happened to you, but like the way the world works and the way certain systems work, it's it's traumatic enough and you need to be able to navigate and also in in this try not to assimilate to what is wanting you to do, which is like bend down on your knees and like <laughs> beg. Decision makers, especially, <laughs> yes. or perceived decision makers. Because yes. something else I've noticed about uh, our lovely Joe Berg <laughs> is that everybody believes they have influence. Everyone. Oh, wow. Yes. Everyone. You're so right. Everyone. No, I- I'll talk to someone and we'll make this deal go through. No, you don't have influence. You, you without, with all due respect, you could be the guy bringing in water on set, but you just because you're on the set, you're going to make it seem like, the, the, the great influence you can make because maybe you have access to the executive producer, you do not. You do not. Even you yourself need to keep putting in the work. Absolutely. And oof, even then, like, it depends, mm, mm. you know, because you could be on set with people and they could all not like you. <laughs> yeah. And they have to write a report about you. At the end of each day. Yeah. Even when you're not messing up. Yeah. But because they don't like you. Every day they'll write something negative. Yes. And then what does that influence? Huh. Because that goes to your boss's boss. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, It's confusing for a lot. I think a lot of us, if not all of us, you know. Um, I don't know. Am I allowed to speak about politics here? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Like it's in- confusing because there's been a culture, right? there's this thing going on on Twitter, like beneficiaries of corruption. Yeah. You know, when competence is no longer the standard Mm. and you come in to a space understanding the rules better than the person in the role that you have to like face. Like you could go to the police station. Like I went to, (laughs) (laughs) I went to the police station and Luckily, I was so blessed, hey? I was redirected to four police stations one time for something that I was reporting. And the last police station, the person who was taking my statements understood where the issue was. Okay. And it had to do with, like, harassment, violation. On set? Uh, no. Okay, something else. And then uh, when that person called the investigating officer, the investigating officer said, hey, my sister. No, man, this is not sexual assault. Sexual assault can only happen by the hands. I'm like, ah, what do you mean? And he's like, no, the definition that you saw on the internet is too vague. I'm like, okay, then read me the definition in your book. He's like, yeah, let me read it. He's like scrim- skimming through. He's going to page nine. When he gets to page nine, then he says, hey, you know what, my sister? I'm going to take your case. It's fine. I'm going to make it a query. Mm. And I'm like, even the cops don't have a unanimous understanding of sure, the law. Sure. You and you, the person who has to trust the cops, mm. understand the law mm. or understand that specific. Thing. But the cops, don't, not all of the cops understand. And then they have to coddle each other because they have to survive that environment. Yeah. So yeah. even the person who sees, yo, mm. he's not going to reprimand him or he's not going to educate him in that moment. And. You know, even at, like, I remember that girl, that young girl who was trending on Twitter because she was being groomed by a pasta. I don't know Correct. if you remember. Correct. Yes. Yeah. And so, like, buying her iPhones. Yes. Yeah, everything. Yeah. Yes. And this has been happening since she was like 14 mm, or something. Mm, mm. So now, like, because now we know, and, and on Twitter, we were like, we can't, we can't keep consuming violence. We have to do something about it. So I call the cops, and then she's like, Eh, Sissy, the the consent age is 13. I'm like, but in context, like, you're not going to tell me that like a 60, he's because he's 50 years old. You're not going to tell me that just because a 50 year old man got a 13 year old to consent to sex. And it what it's not, it's statutory rape, mm. but she doesn't even understand the context of things. Right. And she's like, no, but the definite. So we're arguing about this. And I'm like, how can you not, you're, you're the person who's meant to be protecting us and you don't have an an understanding, understanding yeah. of nuance and the law. And so it's the same. The reason I'm bringing these, these social political issues up is because it's the same thing 
within the entertainment industry huh. where people despise competence and they value something else. Huh. I think people value <laughs> I think people value abuse and violence and a person's ability to intimidate a room huh. more than they do a respectful safe environment and respecting people and actually mm, hiring mm, people mm, for mm, competence mm. and making sure you protect the people around you. Yeah. Uh, it brings me to the question um do, do, do you feel safe safe as a young woman in this industry? No. No, ne? No. no. Um I don't and I and Honestly, you know, the more you talk to people, the more you realize that even men don't feel safe. Huh. You know, men don't feel safe. Um, you witness things on sets happening to men. And like, it's like, that's not okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you go to him? Is he going to find offense if I say... If you notice that yes, he's, he's been yeah, violated, violated yeah. Um, do I go to him? Do I say something? Does it emasculate him if I stand up for him? Um, does he want to say something? Um, is his silence, you know, perhaps protecting him from, you know, him being... Keeping his job? Yeah, keeping his job, number one. Yeah. And also his social standing as a man, mm -hmm. you know? Um and a lot of grooming happens with men in the industry as well. But like the whole, the whole system is messed up that we can't, there can only be one victim in the room. There can only be one type of victim in the room. And even if that person's a victim, they hate that person. <laughs> like I said, like we shame people for existing in very creative ways. Mm, 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 um, mm. So it's, not that it's just not safe for me as a young black woman. I understand where I am in the food chain, but I don't think it can be safe. You, you know, like it's just, it's not safe for any of us. Mm -hmm. Sorry, it just went out. Um, We are nearing the end of our conversation. Uh, I, I'll, I'll go deep one more time. Yeah. Um, God gives you an opportunity for 30 seconds to get onto a phone call um and in this phone call you 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 have to hear you have to speak to your dad mm -hmm. for okay, I'll give you a minute not 30 seconds and it's only one phone call that's it till you die that's all you're getting shucks what are you saying to him um hey dad i went on this really cool podcast and i spoke about you <laughs> <laughs> and i feel like i speak about you a lot um and I, you know, and I know that you messed up in certain ways, but I also know that you went through so much violence growing up. And so um, I'm honored and privileged to have had access to tools that could nav help me na navigate the traumas that I went through. And I'm so sad that you didn't have the kind of environment that could protect you or at least, you know, try to support and heal you in the times where you needed that when you were a child and so for that I'm sorry not because it's my fault but I'm sorry because that shouldn't have happened and we have a lot of work to do to make sure that the society is safe for everybody and that we don't you know groom predators last but not least Nirvana Nogam Selu what's that one thing in life you know for sure one thing in life I know for sure is that I'm turning 28th on the 17th <laughs> of July. <laughs> and God is good for that. Yeah. God is good because I, wow, I made it to 28. And yeah. it's incredible. Yeah. And I'm going to keep growing. Um, thank you for sharing even the uncomfortable parts of yourself in this conversation. Um, I wish you the best as you navigate your emotions, your mental health, uh, your physical health, because I see you even <laughs> take care of your physical health. And and also, uh, and just navigating the industry, because as you say, you've been in it for so long, but you're still upcoming, which is such a, a, a bad thing to be, to be saying about a person who's putting in the work as you are. So thank you for your time. You. Um, I hope you enjoyed the experience and you enjoyed the ride. You're such a safe space. Thank you for facilitating <laughs> this. I really appreciate you this and is... your amazing team. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a pleasure. I hope you guys enjoyed the episode. I'll see you on the next one.
Introducing the epitome of luxury living, Galu Luxury Villas and Suites, your private sanctuary of opulence and elegance. Nestled amongst the lush, sun-kissed landscapes of Durban, KwaZulu-Natal, this Galu Luxury Villa is a paradise of tranquility, offering breathtaking panoramic views of the neighborhood. Step into a world of refined luxury where every detail has been meticulously crafted to create an atmosphere of sophistication and comfort. This villa is kept within a gated and secure property for your peace of mind. The Kalu Villa is available for both short-term and long-term stays, making it the ideal location for your next vacation or special event. This villa boasts spacious living areas and floor-to-ceiling windows that flood the interior with natural light, making you feel at one with the surrounding beauty paired with multiple terraces, an outdoor lounge and a dining area. Live the dream, make memories and indulge in the life you deserve. Contact us today to book your stay or to learn more about this exquisite property. Your oasis of opulence awaits.